Welcome to this new installment in this series of videos about the world of finance that we're making in collaboration with Value School. Hey, by the way, their website is now available in English. I'll leave the link here in case you want to learn a little bit more about this project, Value School. But having said that, let's get started. Friends, I don't think it's too hard for me to convince you that Harley-Davidson is the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the United States, and one of the most legendary and iconic brands in the American economy today. And not just in the United States. According to the popular ranking made by the consultancy firm Into Brands on brand valuation, Harley-Davidson remains one of the 100 most valuable brands in the world. The unique engine noise firing from its pistons and its iconic place in popular culture. Can you imagine Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper in Easy Rider without their customized Harleys? How about that scene in Born to be Wild? Well, with a Kimco 125, it just wouldn't have been quite the same. Anyway, who hasn't heard of the king of bike culture? You don't have to know anything about motorcycles to know what a Harley is. Although to be fair, if you ask younger people this question, then the answer may be very different from what we all think. You'll soon see what I mean. The thing is, despite everything, the last six years have been terrifying for Harley-Davidson stakeholders. Over this time, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin-based company has seen its share price plummet by nearly 70%. We're talking about a company with a straightforward and easy to understand business. Basically, Harley-Davidson operates two business areas, the production and sale of motorcycles and accessories on the one hand, which accounts for 88% of the company's revenue, and the financial division on the other, that roughly accounts for the remaining 12% of revenue. From there, we can identify its brand has a clear competitive advantage, and usually its product, the bikes, are directed towards customers with higher disposable income, which in principle, represents presents more strength. And as if that weren't enough, over the last few years, this company has quoted a price to profits PP ratio that is substantially lower than that of the US stock exchange average, about 13 times its profits. That is, we have an uncomplicated business, a valuable brand, a leadership position, and a very reasonable PP ratio. During these last six years, this company should have been squarely on the radar of many investors. However, as we have already mentioned, during this time, the share price has actually collapsed by 70%. For many analysts, this makes it an example of what is known as a value trap. So, what is a value trap? Let's say that in financial slang, a value trap is a company that seems to trade below its intrinsic value, but that for some reason it is not undervalued, but in fact the opposite, therefore becoming a risky investment. These are usually companies in decline with structural problems. Well, the fact is that this company, one of the great icons of Made in the USA, is currently going through one of the most turbulent and complicated periods in its entire history. And the obvious question we should ask is, what's going on with one of the most legendary companies in American industry? What could possibly explain its share price experiencing such a collapse? <laughs> What's more, right now, in the face of the enormous difficulties it faces, a plan has been put in place to restructure the entire company from top to bottom. What is this plan? Can it succeed? In this video, we'll tell you all about what's happening with the most well-known motorcycle manufacturer in the world. So, let's begin. The Golden Age like any good success story in the United States, this one also begins at home, though this time not in a garage. The first workshop was in the basement of the Davidson family home, although soon after, the activity was moved to a small shed in the family garden. It was there, in the early 20th century, in 1903 to be exact, that Milwaukee engineer William Harley and his friend Arthur Davidson designed a motorized bike, a device whose first engine had a lever belt transmission and a total of three horsepower. Yes, that's what I said, three horsepower. To go up inclines, you had to put your feet on the ground and push to help the machine move. Even so, that's where the great success story began. Gradually, the company grew, and just three years later, in 1906, the new company inaugurated a new workshop of 200 meters square and had six employees. And from there, well, from there, the takeoff was meteoric. 
By 1920, Harley Davidson was already the world's largest motorcycle manufacturer, largely thanks to the role it played during the World War I. Throughout this time, the Milwaukee Company manufactured more than 20,000 motorcycles for the US Army. Over the years, military conflicts played a key role in the development of this company. During World War II, for example, Harley Davidson manufactured nearly 90,000 motorcycles for the US military. It could be said that this involvement boosted Harley Davidson's image as a 100% American product. So, after the war, this company not only maintained its strong position in the North American market, taking more than 50% of all motorbike sales, it also became an emblem, an unmistakable icon in American culture. Groups of bikers, war veterans, and appearances in films such as Terminator, Robocop, Pulp Fiction, or Rocky, among many others. And of course, it's had its tough years too. Competition from European and especially Japanese brands had Harley Davidson on the ropes in the 1980s. In 1982, sales fell just to over 28,000 units, and the worst was expected. This was something that had already happened to Harley's well known rival, Indian Motors, which ended up filing for bankruptcies on successive occasions and passing from hand to hand as manufacturing was constantly interrupted by financial problems. However, President Reagan's decision to set tariffs on Japanese motorcycle imports, along with a complete restructuring of the company, changed everything everything. And so, year after year, Harley-Davidson has maintained its top position in the North American market. Of course, the problems it is now facing are a little different. Listen up. A cold engine. As we've told you already, Harley-Davidson is going through one of the most complicated periods in its entire history. That their shares have plummeted by 70% in the last six years, it's no accident. The truth is, this old rock star of the highways hasn't really rocked for many years. You could see in this table that while over the last six years virtually all of its rivals have seen their motorcycle sales grow from one year to the next, Harley-Davidson has seen its motorcycle sales reduce at an average rate of 4% per year, year after year. Even if we take into account the relatively strong revenues in its financial division, the result is that corporate sales have been losing ground for years. In fact, in terms of the number of bikes sold, sales in 2019 were at the lowest levels of the last 16 years. And this in companies with so much operational leverage that require a lot of investment in capital such as factories, machines, distribution centers, etc. Well, it is a problem, and a very serious one. For example, the return on invested capital in this company in 2019 was 50% lower than the averages of the previous five years, and less than half of what the company obtained in 2014. A similar evolution to that recorded by its net margin, that has dropped from levels of close to 15% to just over half that amount. All this while the company has seen its leverage levels skyrocket. The combination of more debt and poorer results brought the debt to EBITDA ratio to be above 7 in 2019. And now in 2020, especially after the impact of the coronavirus, the suggestion is that it could be much, much worse. So, what's really going on with Harley-Davidson? Why on earth are its bikes having such a hard time? Isn't it still one of the great American brands at the end of the day? Well, that's exactly what we want to get into. You see, according to an analysis published in 2019 by the investment bank UBS, the typical owner of a Harley is a white man, married, about 50 years old, and with an income of above $90,000 per year. That is, a generational shift is making the younger audience lose the special attraction for types of motorcycles that are large, heavy, and above all, very expensive. So what we have is a buyer with an average age of more than 50 years. And although the company has sought to reach out to a younger audience, the truth is that so far it has really not succeeded. And that is certainly not a good omen. As the baby boomer generation ages, it stands to reason that the potential customer base shrinks. And besides that, we have to add in the increasing competition that comes with this kind of generational change. For example, there are the good results obtained by the rival company Polaris after relaunching the legendary American brand Indian Motorcycle, a brand that specializes in large motorcycles. 
However, despite the predictable lows of April and March 2020, at the time of making this video, the price of Harley Davidson shares has just soared to over 75%, from the $15 to $27.27. And not only that, many analysts have also changed their recommendation on this company. And all this, all this has a lot to do with a change that occurred in February. A game changer? After trying many things, such as pushing models focused on a younger audience, boosting loyalty programs, betting on developing electric models, or seeking to reduce costs with factories in India, finally, in February 2020, the company's former CEO, Matt Livatic, decided to set aside. And until that point, nothing had worked. The position of maximum responsibility and the management of the company then fell into the hands of someone with a completely different profile. Matt Levatic was an engineer with a long history in the industry. The new person chosen to take charge of Harley Davidson was Jochen Zeist, a marketing specialist, environmental activist, and collector of African art. Evidently, a very clear example of how the company wants to change from top to bottom and from left to right completely. But who exactly is he? Well, to give you an idea, we're talking about a marketing specialist who started his career in the personal care multinational Colgate Palmolive, and who rapidly rose to fame and earned his fortune when at 30, he became the CEO of Puma, a company that was practically bankrupt at the time. Incidentally, he was the youngest CEO of a publicly traded company in the history of Germany. Before long, Zeitz managed to straighten things out and change the company's image into a fashion brand linked to a sporting lifestyle. For example, they made an agreement with Madonna, the Queen of Pop, to wear their trainers during her tours. When he left the post two decades later, Puma's shares had increased 27-fold. Well, that's exactly what he intends to do with Harley Davidson, to carry out a complete corporate revolution that puts the iconic American brand back on top. For example, plans include substantially reducing the number of bike models, which improves factory productivity and efficiency on one hand, and on the other, enables them to focus on the most cost-effective models. He has also announced that Harley-Davidson will focus exclusively on the 50 geographic markets where the company is strongest. That is, in locations where the numbers don't work, they will just simply close them. In addition, the laying off of 13% of the workforce worldwide, the suspension of share buyback programs, and plans to reduce current expenses and capital investment have been also announced so far. All this together, with a reinforced commitment to electric motorbikes and a new approach to marketing, is what this CEO hopes will be able to turn around the difficult situation that this Milwaukee manufacturer is going through. The question is, will Harley Davidson succeed, or will it continue to destroy its value on its own race to the abyss? Can you make the shares of an American icon take off, or are they doomed to remain a value trap? Leave your answer in the comments. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media Podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that are not mine. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll be seeing you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.